Welcome to the Echo Essentials Podcast. I'm Scott Clark. And I'm Dave Dale. And I didn't get my car stolen this week. How about you, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> I had mine stolen last week. Um, yeah, and so uh, as we're recording this, I had a call from OPP in Caledon. They found it. But wow. And so I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> it was taken in Toronto? Yeah, I was at the Toronto airport at a conference uh, last week. And... Um, it was stolen. Uh, I walked out, walked out to the parking lot, and you know, as I've gotten older, it's like my I, I admit my memory's not as good as it used to be. And I'm looking around, going, "Oh my God, Scott! Like seriously, you're where did you park? Now? Where did I park?" <laughs> and I'm looking around, right? I can't, I don't see it, and I'm walking around and going, "I could have sworn I parked it right there. I could have sworn I parked it right there." And then I go on my, like all these cars have apps and stuff now, so I can start it from my app and stuff, but, but also I can locate it. And then I see it's five kilometers away. And I went, I did not park five kilometers away and walk to the hotel. I went, oh, dang, it's stolen, right? The interesting part about it is as you go through that process. So I, I immediately go, okay, Zen, it's like, this is going to be a long day. So just take the long, it's going to be a long day. Every phone call is going to be long and it's going to be the same questions and I'm going to be on hold. So, but the thing that I found interesting was when I got into, I had to take a cab to the police station. <laughs> it's so busy down there. So I was at the Toronto Hilton airport. All the drivers that were taking me, you know, around were saying, oh yeah, this happens like all the time. Nobody was surprised in any way, shape or form. Oh yeah, there's like four a day or something from this location and like they, so if you're parking and like often we, you know, when we're up here, we'll get a hotel and we get the, the parking at the hotel when we go on a trip or something like there's a good chance your vehicle won't be there. So the police said to me when I called, it's like, do not, I said, I have the location of it currently. Do not go and uh, track that vehicle. It's very dangerous. You don't know the people that took it, all those sort of things. I said, I understand. And First, so then you went. And then I went. <laughs> So I just, I understood, but all I wanted to do was I wanted to see if it was there. Cause let's be honest, the police are busy yeah. when you have to take a cab, yeah. when you have a stolen. You're not vehicle. trusting that they're on the job. No, not that. It's just, they're busy. It's, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. When there's so many stolen cars, they, yeah. like, like how do they, you know? So I went just to see if I saw it and then I would, I'd say, Hey, I did locate it. Here it is. And I see it. I'm not going to touch anything. Right. It wasn't there though. They must have disabled the tracker at that mm -hmm. point, right. and then it was gone. So I thought, oh, it's in a can see container heading over to Dubai or wherever, right? What kind of truck is it? Uh, Toyota Tundra. Mm. Um, and uh, so yeah, um, so been going through all the insurance and all that sort of stuff, and within I don't know five six hours, I had a rental to get home again, and and then I just had a call like an hour before we went on to do this that Caledon OPP said, Hey, we found your vehicle. Hmm. So I don't know what happens now. Yeah. <laughs> they, they did say one of the windows is knocked out. And so I don't know, has it been raining down there? It's like, who knows? I don't know. And I had junk in it. Like probably many of us do like sunglasses and charging cords and all that junk and keys and stuff. Yes. Oh, now I, I have all my keys to lock up. <laughs> like, you know, all my stuff is like, how am I going to unlock my trailer and this and that? All the keys were in there. Mm. So anyhow, we'll see. What a big pain in the neck. What, what year uh, truck? 2022. How many kilometers were on it? Just curious. Okay, you feel sound like the cops now. Um, <laughs> I never trust when you start asking a lot of questions. I think it was 53,000 on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to calculate what the insurance company would do as far as providing um, enough to replace it these days with the the prices, the way things are. Well, I had replacement cost. Yeah. Right. So that's a good thing. Yeah. And here's something I learned. So if someone's listening in, it's like you have replacement costs, but they're, they asked me, okay, do you have replacement costs? And if you do, how long is it? I went, how long is it? What does that mean? Well, replacement costs on your insurance is, it, it only lasts so many times before they don't have replacement costs anymore because it's depreciated right? Yeah, right. so much. But I had like, I think it said five iterations or five, basically five years. Mm -hmm. So that's I would kind of why I was asking. Yeah. That, so, yeah. but I didn't know those things. It's interesting. Oh, here's something else I learned. 
it was my daughter last night said, hey, because I was down by the airport, right? Hey, dad, you should uh, you should check with 407, the highway, to see whether or not they you're racking up something on 407. Now, I think if someone's stealing your vehicle, yes, they might take it for you know one part, but they're not going to be traveling the 407 for the next week, right? <laughs> Stop laughing. So what are you laughing at? <laughs> Uh, it's just funny because I'm like, that'll show him. I stole his <laughs> truck and, <laughs> and I'm going to rack up his 407 bill. So, but what was interesting is I contacted 407. It's like, I just wanted to know if it was, if anybody used it like after the date I last had it. And she said, no. And I was in a chat form with her, right? This woman, she was the woman who was uh, helping me on 407, gave me some information. Nobody else did. She said, Hey, I just want to let you know. Did you contact the Ministry of Transportation to tell them that your vehicle was stolen? I went, no. Why? I don't know why. I, I contacted the police, insurance, all this. Flag so your license plate. Flag your license plate because it can be used in other things and you have to flag your license plate. I said, nobody told me that. She says, yeah, most people, <laughs> the police or that don't tell you all everything. So yeah. I didn't know that. So another little, I was very appreciative of her. Now, is there anything that you could have done uh, for theft prevention that you uh, have learned since? The the only thing I would learn because it's you know it's a newer vehicle, so it has all computers and stuff in it, right? It has a touch button, you know, starter and all that, right? So there's no real key; it's just a key fob. The only thing I had heard at this point is like you just want to deter them as best you can. So if they see it's going to take longer than usual, so one of those bars that you put on your steering wheel yeah, yeah. would be. I'm like, uh, I <laughs> yeah, don't know if I want to have but a bar. It, and... that, this day and age, it's funny that they have so, so much technology on anti-theft, but it's so much easier to steal these days. I think so. Yeah. Even the, the guy at the rental place, he said, oh, uh, the hotel across the street from us here, they get four a day will get stolen. It's like, man, it is a racket, right? Wow. And they're so efficient. They can, you know, break in, boom, and they're gone before... You know, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm shocked it was found, actually. That's, I'm shocked. Maybe if you had the, you know, those uh, parking cleats that they put on cars when they, uh, they're, uh, yeah. in a spot? Yeah. Maybe buy one of those and put it on your own truck and it, that'll, uh, oh right? My Wouldn't God. that be fun? Yeah. Uh, no, it's just so much work. Could you imagine me parking? Well, how much I'm work going did you have coffee? to do yesterday trying to get your stolen truck? I bet you it would be, uh, if I had a, a cleat, I'd bring it down to Toronto and put it on my car. Did you know what? Yeah. If uh, yes, you know what? Now I I I'm with you on this one, Dave. <laughs> I actually think doing that when you're you're putting it in, in Toronto area and different things like that, I, I might do that. But I wouldn't do it like every day. I'm going to Northgate Shopping Center and uh, putting a bar on. I'm locking my wheels. That and, like, and rigging a sort of a spike that comes up through the seat. If you don't have the right code or something like that, just a, well, just a little sort of uh, yeah. But I, w yeah. I would that would probably go off when I didn't want it to go off. So no, no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And all of this happened during Kindness Week. Yeah, right? so that's, last that's week right. was Kindness Week with the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association. How kind is that? You know, do good, feel good. But I, I took the. Uh, I said, you know what? This person must have needed my truck more than me. Oh, you really? The benevolent you. Well, and and I took the approach as like, okay, we all spend a lot of money on insurance, right? So let's let's see how this plays out, right? Yep. Let's see what goes down here. I'm gonna... Well, the story isn't over, so we still might get no, some interesting... No, the story's not over! <laughs> Barry, you heard a little bit that they didn't want... They kind of like just left your truck. Like, they clearly didn't sell it or anything. So that kind of hurt. I your... think they found it in a, a chop shop uh, uh, lot oh, in Calinon. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. It, Instead of just like was... leaving it off to the side. Yeah, he didn't say exactly where. He yeah, says I it's wonder. in. A... Yeah. Oh, you think maybe they've chopped it up or something? Or he didn't. He doesn't know the condition. He knows one window was knocked out, but that's about it. Because I'd be offended if somebody stole my car and then just left it because it wasn't good enough. <clears throat> you know what's interesting? It, it, <laughs> well, he said it wasn't steal my good car. enough. Um. He said that, well, the other thing is, is because I didn't have a key. So how did they start it? So what did they do to the interior? Someone actually said to me that, you know, sometimes, Scott, it's actually way better that the whole thing is gone. It gets way more complicated with insurance and everything once you, if you find it, mm -hmm. because of all the different damages and different things that I, I don't know what's happened, right? So, So with your bad luck, they found it. 
<laughs> with my bad luck, they found it. Well, um, we have an excellent interview with uh, Giselle Hebert coming up. Yeah. And uh, the CAS has never looked so good in my eyes as far as what she's done with uh, and her team has done for the Adelmwood. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm excited about this. I've always been a big fan of Giselle and, and what her team does. She has an incredible group. But she's also announced her retirement too, which mm-hmm. is kind of sad. So let's let's hear from Giselle and let's get into it. Today we have Giselle Hiber here. She's executive director of the Nipsey Perry Sound uh, Children's Aid Society, and she's nearing retirement. Had a full career. Welcome. Thank you so much. You've um, you grew up in Sudbury. Yes, I did. And then and then you made your career here. Tell uh, what what brought you here. So I actually went to um, to I I do come from Sudbury. I went to Canada College as a to take the social work course when I was uh, younger. Uh, and at the age of eighteen, I did a placement actually at the at the time it was only Nipissing uh, Children's Aid Society. So I did a placement actually in Sturgeon Falls. Uh, and then was hired for uh, the summer and then full-time in uh, in the fall. We were actually at uh, Cambrian at the same time, too. Yes, we were. Yeah, you, yes. so you started off I think there. I saw you there. No. <laughs> <laughs> and how did, why did you choose social work? There's usually some sort of reason why you lean into that. Yeah, it's interesting because my uh, dad was a, a guidance counselor uh, growing up. Uh, and I remember when we were younger, my dad had um, an affinity to homeless people uh, and would all, I remember sitting in the back seat with my brothers and uh, my dad would want to bring some of these homeless people home. And I remember him and my mom debating and she was saying no, and, but he always made a point of going to bring them coffee or spend time with them. Uh, and then I would hear stories about, you know, um, kids that he was working with. He was in a high school. Uh, and always knew that um, that's sort of what I wanted to do. And it was it's interesting because I have a twin brother who became a psychologist. And I have an older brother who is um, teaches at Collège Boreal, but he also says, if I had my way, I would have gone into social work. So, yeah, so that's that's sort of what happened. It's uh, We do, uh, outside of ECHO, <clears throat> we're involved with social services. So um, we, you know, we meet people on the front lines. It's not, I know probably the altruistic side of getting into social services about helping other and, and doing good, but when you're into that, it is, it's the fog of war. It's, it's a, there isn't a lot of glory. There isn't a lot of people patting you on your back and, and your colleagues. It's a really tough um, career. Yeah, I, th- I think it, you know, I think of, because um, I've been there 39 years now at the agency, and I think of even how it's different from back then. Um, yeah, can you explain that, the difference? Yeah, so I think the, you know, when we look at sort of the issues that are happening with our, in our community, there's they're much more complex, uh, even than they were when I first started. Uh, we used to work oftentimes with families that were just sort of struggling or that needed some support. Uh, and now with the complexity of those, um, of, of the issues, the social issues that are happening in our community, there's just sort of no space for that. It, it's mostly uh, we're working with families with significant uh, complexities around, you know, domestic violence, uh, mental health issues, um, substance use issues. Uh, So it is. And I, you know, I often say um, to staff, you know, social work is a vocation. Mm. Um, And, uh, you know, for for people that are in it for many years, it does take something from you. It has to. Sure. If you do it well, uh, because I think people that you're working with really feel uh, if you understand them, if you're hearing them versus listening to them. Uh, And in order to do that, you do. You give a piece of yourself. So... Yeah, it takes its toll. I think there's um, situations that happen that touch you more than, or, or more deeply than others, for sure. But yeah, it's not it's not easy. You're right. When <clears throat> when you sit back now after uh, you know a very uh, incredible career, and you look at the differences of you know when you started and, and you say about complex, what is, what is it that's complex now? Is it? I I don't even know what to suggest. What yeah, I think it's um, it's it's a combination of things. I think uh, when I think of uh, values mm. uh, that we have, they're they're different than when we were younger. 
Um, you know, I think of, you know, I had a stay at home mom, my dad worked, uh, but we had, you know, we had dinner together every night. Um, you know, families lived very closely together. Um, even extended family did. I think of my, you know, history and we're French Canadian. So at Christmas, it was, you know, 30 people in a room singing songs. And, and that is now so different because people, you know, they get educated, they leave the community. So th that sense of family um, and e even, you know, you don't often hear families having dinner together anymore. Right. Everybody's on the fly. There's, you know, they're doing their sports uh, you know, people are working night shift. Uh, and um, so that that impacts kids, I think. Mm -hmm. And it impacts families as well. Yeah. And what about the Children's Aid Society as a whole? How has that evolved? Because it's, it's really, you know, it's really went through a few iterations over time where you've, you've really needed to explain to the community what the Children's Aid Society does. It doesn't do this. It does, like it's had... It's had sort of a metamorphosis over probably your career. Yes, absolutely. So when I'm hired in 1985, uh, I'm the 23rd employee hired at the agency. <laughs> and I think we're at about, and at that time, it was just called Nipissing Children's Aid Society. Uh, and, um, you know, we had, uh, I think now we're about 175. Uh, and we've amalgamated with uh, Perry Sound. So it's Nipissing and Perry Sound Children's Aid Society. Uh, and you're right. I mean, Children's Aid Society has, um, you know, is not known. We're known for sort of apprehending kids is what, uh, and we've really taken a lot of time to try to change that sort of narrative mm -hmm. uh, within our community. I remember at one point we had changed our name to Child and Family Services mm -hmm. in order to be sort of more uh, inclusive and uh, to try to get away from that stigma. But what we found, this was years ago, was that people didn't know who we were anymore. They didn't know who to call. So I remember, um, and I was just the frontline staff at the time, but we went back to um, Children's Aid Society. Uh, but now, you know, we're multi-service. We, and a lot of people in the community don't know that. So we do early intervention services. We do youth justice services. Uh, and even the way we work with families now is much different. Uh, it's much less, I want to say, punitive. There's much more sort of, in, we try to really engage families in decision. Who knows better uh, about their family than the family themselves and those that sort of surround them. Um, so we're really trying to um, change the narrative around uh, the work that we want to do and are committed to doing with families. It's, <clears throat> I was recently listening to an economist talk about, uh, you know, people within social services, how we as a society look at social services, and we're not looking at, um, at things in the proper lens, I would say. And so it really talked about, it was something you said there about preventative care. And so uh, the the part that jumped out to me was this economist said, do you know what it costs when you put someone in a hospital? Like it, they were mainly talking about homelessness at this point, but I'm sure it translates to uh, uh, children's issues as well. But you put them into a hospital for a month, it costs $30,000. You incarcerate them for a month, it's $15,000. If you if they go to a homeless shelter, it's anywhere from six to eight thousand dollars a month. And currently, what what we provide people uh, in need is something like three hundred and something dollars a month to find uh, home care. Right. So, what what they were really getting at was we need to lean into preventative care and preventative uh, like just exactly what you said about as opposed to probably at one time children's aid society was they were known to come in scoop kids out of homes right that's the narrative that you were that you're looking to change how is it how has it changed now and and is it leading this is the time of your career where you get to go okay i get to reflect yes <laughs> i get yes, to say yes. and reflect and i'm i'm a person that's in my head all the time so i'm always doing it but it's really interesting you say that because that hasn't changed from the sort of funding perspective and from the uh, government's perspective. Uh, prevention isn't sort of something that's uh, a priority. Uh, I don't get funded at all for prevention services. Really? Yeah. So uh, because it's and it's sort of like you stay in your lane, your child protection, you stay in your lane. Um, and so... You know, which is, it's really difficult because as you say, we can see when we look at what's happening within our society around the homelessness and the sort of opioid crisis that we're facing right now. 
it's that's what I find s- extremely frustrating is that we and we need to put money and energy and time and trying to sort of resolve those issues. But what I get frustrated with is that there's nothing happening upstream for kids. So why would we think that something we're going to get a different outcome when we're doing nothing to ensure that kids can have a different sort of outcome? And that's, for me, what is so exciting about Elmwood. Mm. And because Elmwood is completely upstream sort Mm -hmm. of um, services for children and families that are accessing that. It's a community space where children and families can come. There's tons of preventative uh, stuff happening there. Uh, But the interesting part is that, you know, we're being watched very closely to ensure that we're not uh, spending any of our sort of funding allocation in that building. So everything that's happening there, other than sort of the operational costs of the lights and the heat, um, that's all happening through donations, through grants, through partnerships with our community uh, partners. Uh, but it it's really exciting because, um, you know, and the vision for expansion of that space will provide something that doesn't exist in our community and really is upstream. So I love it. Um, that's where my sort of a lot of my energy is being put right now. Yeah. Because I really want to see that through. Because um, I think it will make a huge difference for kids in our f- and families in our community. And now a word from one of our great sponsors, Casey's. This weekend, make your way to Casey's Restaurant in North Bay for an unforgettable get together. Dive into our delicious appetizers and enjoy the best drafts in town. It's the perfect spot to unwind, catch up with friends, and savor great flavors. Don't miss out on the fun. Join us at Casey's for a weekend filled with good food, great drinks, and even better company. When you took me on the tour of Elmwood, um, it was a former school? Yes, Ecole Saint-Paul, primary school. And it looked like it had gone through some type of transformation into a community space. and you sounded more excited about that and what the possibilities were. Uh, you're heading into retirement. How, how, says, how are you going to finish this off? Well, I'm going to. Don't, I don't know how yet, <laughs> but it's going to happen for sure. How were you able to uh, get the funding and do, what are you looking for to make that uh, uh, dream come true? Yeah, so I mean, I think I'd be remiss not to th- uh, thank uh, Stephen Beauchamp. Um, so he was a, he's our donor. Um, so we had purchased that school in uh, 2007, and it really was uh, to have it as our one site uh, for our staff, because currently we're in three sites, and there's that's problematic. Um, and But of course, you need capital dollars to do that, and that wasn't sort of coming. So it sat empty, actually, for 10 years. And uh, then we were approached, um, Ray Beauchamp, who was the uh, manager of HR and finance at the agency, um, his son, he's retired now, but his son... Um, he owns a, a payroll company in the States. And he had given his parents $150,000 and said, listen, invest this in the community however you wish to make it a sort of a better place. So uh, Ray had approached us and said, you know, what do you think? Um, and I said, well, leave it with us. We'll give you a few proposals. And so we had um, we'd given a few proposals and landed on a youth hub. We thought that that would make sort of a difference for the youth that we work for. So we renovated one of the classrooms uh, with that money, and um, we called it the Beauchamp Hub. Uh, And so there was some programming happening there with our youth. Uh, And then we were approached by Near North District School Board, and we were asked to do um, what used to be called a section classroom. It's not called DCPP. Uh, for high school kids, and that's for kids that have been either suspended or expelled from school and are really struggling. So it's more one-on-one, and they work at their own pace. And the goal is always to get them back into the schooling system. And sometimes it happens, and sometimes they graduate, actually, from the classroom. We've had a few uh, really exciting graduations there. Uh, And then we were approached to do the same for grade 7 and 8. And so otherwise, and and then it's sort of just, we started to sort of do small things in there. We opened a a clothing boutique, and... um, which is, you know, sort of like a mini value village where we, because we saw that our uh, service recipients were really struggling financially. We know that poverty is uh, alive and well. Um, and uh, as well as our foster parents, you know, that were sort of um, said we could 
you know, we use the clothing, but, you know, we could recycle that clothing within, uh, within the agency. So we opened a clothing boutique. And then during the pandemic, we opened a, um, it started with a cabinet with, uh, for food pantry for some of our youth um, who were really struggling with food insecurity. Uh, and then it sort of just started growing from there. Um, and you saw the space. Uh, and Stephen Beauchamp came about a year and a half ago. And the youth were there. We hadn't coached them or anything. Um, and he came with his wife, beautiful, wonderful people, salt of the earth people. And um, and the youth were there. So we brought them in to meet the youth. And it was absolutely magical. Um, and I wish I would have taped it. Um, you know, we had a youth talking about how he was depressed. He was in his basement. Somebody convinced him to come. And he now comes every day. It's sort of his, um, uh, he's made connections. He now has friends. Um, he's learned about sort of independent skills. And so anyway, we left that meeting and Stephen said, I'm giving you another million. Um, wow. US, which is 1.3 wow. million, which is, yeah, I cried. Gives me shivers just wow. thinking about it. Yeah. And uh, so, and we have a youth advisory committee uh, at the agency and, you know, everything that happens in that space is youth informed. Uh, so we went to them and we said, you know, what, what now? Like, what are your priorities? Uh you know, with sort of a renovation. So they said first uh, priority was a, a big kitchen. And when we think of our own sort of families and mm. where does the magic happen? Happens in, in kitchen. kitchens, cooking together, and they wanted to eat together. Uh, so it was a kitchen. Uh, the second piece was uh, sporting equipment. They really wanted um, the sporting piece. And the third was tech. Mm. Uh, so we uh, moved forward with renovations and you saw the space. Um, and, uh, and the vision really for that space is not, it's called Elmwood and it's intentionally called Elmwood and not the Children's Aid Society mm. because we wanted that to be really, um, an open low barrier space for children, youth and families. So, you know, youth that are coming in right now and the bulk of them are child welfare, uh, kids right now, somehow affiliated with the agency. They don't have to be in the care of the society, but um, and the only reason for that is because the staff that I have in there are either by donation or grants, because again, I can't spend any money there, but the vision is really to open it up to the entire community. Um, and you come in, you say it's low barrier in the sense that you don't need a referral. Uh, you just, we ask your name, we ask for an emergency contact and off you go. Um, we have a huge gym, um, and we have four uh, spaces that are open to any community. So you could, um, like the city came the other day, they're having a big meeting in one of our rooms. There's no charge. Uh, we ask for a donation or to the food pantry, who is now, which is now expanded greatly as has the clothing boutique. Uh, so the gym is used every single day. We have from, you know, young kids, it's been designated, Elmwood's been designated as early on through DSAB. So that's little munchkins uh, who use the gym and seniors come and pickleball in the gym. And again, there's no, it's free. There's no cost to that. Uh, the community kitchen, which is a huge industrial kitchen, is also uh, open to the community as our two sort of uh, meeting spaces. Uh, we received, we also have VON in there. We have a partnership with uh, VON. Uh, a yeah, nurse practitioner, right? Yeah, yeah, a nurse practitioner that's there, uh, which is amazing. Uh, Do you sell it? Um, I'm something like this doesn't happen without, you know, first of all, you're the pointy edge of the spear. I, uh, and, and I've mm. met your staff and I met, I met your staff even outside of the children's mm. aid. And there's an energy that, that your group has that's so positive. So I want to, it's, it's sort of twofold. I'd like to know about your, your team that, that drove this. Cause I've been there several times during the evolution of it building, but so I, I know you, you've announced your retirement, but that doesn't happen in a week. Like you don't think, oh, next week I'm going to retire. Like <clears throat> you sort of, be, only because my friends are now retiring and they're like, they're five years out on, oh, five years out and they're counting down the days, right? You took this project on when you didn't have to take this project on. I think many of people in your position that you know you're five years out from retiring or whatever that number is, or you don't have to take this on, there's... Uh, yes, it's a legacy project. Yes, yes, yes. But the things that you've probably had to personally go through and your team has had to go through because they've had to develop this and, of course, do all their full-time work on top of that as well. 
Can you speak to a little bit of that, why you took something like this on when you didn't have to, because it wasn't, because nobody was supporting you. You had to figure out how to connect all the dots and then you needed a team behind you to drive it. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll talk about my team. I can't, yeah, that's, yeah. I get emotional when I think about it because I, you know, as a leader, I always say that, um, you know, the kudos often go to the executive director, the mm -hmm. CEO of the organization, and it's so not about us. It really isn't. Um, and I feel bad about that because I think that, um, you know, I always say a good leader, you know, surrounds themselves with people that are better than them and stays out of their way. Um, and, you know, I have such dedicated staff, uh, for sure. You know, I, I think of my own career. I, I, I never counted the days. I never, I'm leaving my career after 39 years with very mixed emotion. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's just time. Uh, my parents are elderly. I want to spend more time with them. Um, you know, there's other sort of projects I'd like probably to take on. I'm not sure yet what I want to do. Uh, but I never, you know, people do count the days. Somebody told me I got two years. I never did that. So when I announced my term, my staff, I remember talking, I, I announced it to my management group, which is 30 and they were like, no reaction. And then all of a sudden somebody said, I'm shocked. And I'm like, guys, I've been here 39 years. How yeah, but you look like a teenager, though. Oh, Let's all be good honest, answer. you do. You do. <laughs> yeah. You look like a teenager. So they said we're shocked. And I think it's because I didn't talk about leaving. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think, I don't know, it, it sort of evolved sort of slowly, this project. Um, and it just sort of built momentum. Um, and it, it, it was just something, like I said before, that feels like it's upstream. Um, and we have such good partnerships within the community that wanted to sort of make it happen. And when they see that, and I think that's what happened with Stephen um, when he came as well, is to see what's happening in that space, regardless of the funding we've received so far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just, excuse me, it's just super, it's super exciting work. Uh, and you're right, without my team sort of um, wanting it to be the best it can be, um, and they are amazing. I, I, I can't say enough about they them. They look so proud. The opening night when you had the Chamber of Commerce after hours, oh, yes. they look, all of them look so proud. Yeah. Like this is their place. This yes. is the community's place. They, it was lovely to see. Yeah. 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 And they're always sort of, it's sort of like they, I, I talk about, you know, what vision is and they just somehow make it happen even better than I wanted it to be. So it's like, I feel so blessed and so fortunate have worked with the people that I'm working with and I'll miss them dearly. Can you describe when you took your parents through Elmwood and what that meant? I haven't yet. What? I haven't. You haven't taken your dad through Elmwood? No. My mom was saying, I know, I feel horrible about that, but I will. I will. Oh, I want to know how that goes. Yes. Because how this story started, right? Your dad, you know, for marginalized yes. in the community and look what you, I know. you've been part of building. No, it's absolutely. Do you think it'll be emotional? Oh, I think so too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, and you know, I was showing uh, Dave the other day when he came, there's a, again, it was going to be our one site and it was probably about two months, two and a half months ago. I said to my staff, like, let's cease all efforts, you know, more than ever government has no interest in capital buildings, bricks and mortar, you know, um, you know, people are working virtual. We never did. We did for a very short period of time, but everybody's at work. And I thought, you know, we're not going to get 20 million. So let's cease all efforts. What we had done when we bought the school is we demoed a lot of it. And there was one wing left that had not, that has not been demoed. And the only reason we couldn't demo it is because at the end of it, there's a mechanical room. Mm. And that was slated to go on the roof of the new one site. So I said to the staff, like, you know what, let's cease all efforts. And why don't we expand Elmwood in that wing? And so we started sort of exploring that and potential partnerships for that. Um, and so we actually, the and it's going to happen, uh, what we're doing there, we have a partnership with the hospital. Um, so it's going, to, and it's all attached to the hub. So it's going to be, for lack of a better word for now, the clinical wing. Uh, and that will be, and we have confirmation, child psychiatry, child psychology, substance use, eating disorders, um, there's going to be a sort of a big workout room for kids, um, and then bookable spaces for clinicians to come in. And, um, you know, the whole 
purpose of that is to have, again, low barrier where people, um, youth can get um, services where they want it, when they want it. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, they're, they're in the, um, you know, youth hub learning about sort of how, you know, the other day it was Service Ontario. How do you, you know, what, what what's a um, SIN number? Why do you need it? Where do you store it? What do you do if it, you know, you, you, uh, you lose it or it gets <laughs> stolen and just sort of things that my kids probably don't even know. Um, but if they're struggling, you can say, listen, you know, there's a group going on on pretend anxiety. Like, why don't we go? Or, you know, you see uh, youth coming into the space and, you know, who you and you think is using uh, that you could say, like, let's let's go talk to somebody. And they're right there. Mm-hmm. So it's a soft handoff to um, to this to the clinical space. And then you're engaging kids. And, and that really is the prevention work. Right. Yeah. That we're hoping to do You're. I think it's really powerful what you're doing. I know, you know, Judy Sharp had retired mm-hmm. a number of years ago. You, you and Judy, yes. uh, were doing really incredible work in our community and 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 bringing groups together. Like by the sound of what you're talking about here, I'm hearing, you know, there's a theme between. And I've always really admired you. I've really admired Judy over the years and and what you're doing. Tell me about you know, as, as you go forward in the future, the barriers you're breaking down or or maybe the silos a little bit so that there is more connection between different organizations. Because currently the way things are designed, just so people know, it's designed to work in silos. Different organizations are, de- that's how it's designed. But it's people like yourself and and other leaders like Judy Sharp is like, okay, how do we break these silos down a little bit just so we can have a lot more efficiency and the efficiency is really about making sure people, children, adults, teens receive services quickly and more efficiently. Yeah. So back in 2020, well, during the pandemic, so let's say 19, uh, 2019, 20, something like that, we uh, we endeavored as a community, so social service agencies, uh, we went through what we call the systems review. Um, so there was a consultant uh, who actually interviewed like 66 uh, people. So staff from all the organizations, um, you know, from leadership to frontline staff around sort of how services happen in our communities for complex uh, youth. And uh, that also entailed uh, interviews with uh, service recipients, so families. Uh, I think there was about 20 of those. And then they reviewed, um, I think it was like 30 of those files, like from cover to cover to see sort of what is it like to try to navigate when you're having issues within your family and with your kids, how, how is it to navigate the service system in our community? And what came back glaring, and we knew that, we, you know, you hear that all the time, it's impossible to navigate. Um, it's, it's fragmented, it's complicated, they never know what door to go to, it's not responsive, there's wait lists. Um, and so out of that came very specific recommendations around changing that and Um, you know, we committed to those families that we were going to go back to them and say, listen, this is what we came up with. And so what do you think? If you were trying to navigate the system again, would this make a difference for your family? So for a multitude of reasons, um, you know, we weren't able to move the needle very far on that. Um, So um, beginning of April, our board um, asked those seven agencies, so that would be the hospital, uh, HANDS, the Children's Mental Health um, Children's Aid Society, the Crisis Center, Association for Community Living, uh, Community Living North Bay. I feel like I'm missing one. Uh, Crisis Center. Um, and we all, so they they asked um, all those agencies to come to a table. So board chairs or board members, as well as the leaders. And uh, it was called the Meeting of the Minds. And um, 30 people came. Uh, and it was held at Elmwood, actually. And uh that the, the entire discussion was about, you know, here is what we committed to doing in 2021 with these families uh, and amongst ourselves to make the system much more responsive uh, and less fragmented. Um, now, I'll give you an example. One example is, you know, I provide, as I said, early intervention services. There's another agency in the, in the community that also provides uh, early intervention services, except, you know, I got those, I received those services and, and began to deliver them when one kid's place didn't exist, but it does now. Mm-hmm. And we have a children's treatment center. So for, from a family's 
a perspective, does that make sense to have three agencies providing? Why would that not be centralized? Hmm. So that's just a bit of a common sense. A common sense. What are you doing? One. Throwing common sense into yeah, a right, government no, organization. It ain't so common anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the same thing happens with youth justice. I have one. Uh, I provide youth justice services. Another agency does, and the crisis center does. So those are just like sort of two examples. Uh, so it was really to bring agencies together to say, you know, look at the recommendations. They still exist today. And they're probably, um, you know, when you think about wait lists and, you know, everybody's having staffing pressures, it's probably, I'm going to say confidently, that it's worse than it was in 2021. So how are we going to sort of mobilize ourselves and mm. let's stop talking and let's start acting? And so it was a great, it was a two hour meeting. The boards were so engaged and there, there was unanimous um, agreement amongst all seven agencies that we were going to move forward with this. So, um, and the three commitments that came out of that meeting were that there's going to be a one day summit with the leaders uh, and that there's going to be an action uh, plan coming out of that day. Um, because boards are saying like, and I get it. You know, we've talked about this. You know, I'm out. It, unless we're taking action, it never happens. We talk, we talk, nothing happens. Um, so for that piece, uh, there's agreement that there's going to be a shared accountability framework, uh, a matrix uh, between all agencies. So executive directors are going to have to report back what that sort of progress is. Um, so that holds us, and I really wanted that, that holds us accountable to making sure that we're, need, you know, we're moving um, things forward. And the board also want the boards also wanted to talk, have a mechanism by which they a platform that they could talk amongst themselves. It's <clears throat> I, now I can actually sense the trepidation you have about retirement. Yeah, uh, only because I would think uh, within your organization and like many government organizations, it's it's a ship you're turning, not a speedboat. So ten years disappears like that, right? And what has to change in that time? It takes decades to change. I can actually hear in your voice and what you're describing massive change that that's coming. So you're probably like, dang, <laughs> it took 40 years to get here. And all the change is happening. Well, and I wanted to make sure, you know, I thought, and I, I do, I feel horrible that we promised those families mostly. Like we, you know, we've, and you're right, there are silos. But we presented to all the different ministries um, around sort of our commitment. And I thought I can't leave without, doing something to try to move this forward. I just I just can't. And when we look at, you know, we think government has the solutions. Hmm. They really don't. They really don't. Um, and when they do, they don't know the business. And who better to sort of direct the ship, as you're saying, than the people that are in it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think of this government, which, you know, which I, I love this piece, is they are very clear we want cost efficiencies. Uh, we want responsive services for Ontarians um, and we want seamless services and integration of services. Um, and because but we know it's better for it people. <laughs> yes. But and you got to yes. figure it out. <laughs> and, but I think if we went to them with a plan, um, that they would be very open to that. I think they would be very open to that. Mm -hmm. So, Well, that's where I'm, I'm heading with my thoughts. Like you're describing... Um, fill in the gap in the community with a community center that uh, bridges to health, social services, and education, um, and as well as uh, uh, other uh, services. What is the next step? What, what legislative-wise needs to be changed to make it so that you don't have to play stick handle around the, the budget rules? Um, and um, how could... It, do you need a foundation or something? Uh, and yeah. this should be a pilot project. They shouldn't be looking at it, making sure you're not spending money on capital. They should be looking at it as a possible solution across the yeah. province. Yeah, and that's a great point. It's funny because I was I was driving here this morning thinking, okay, you know, maybe Elmwood needs its own governance structure. Maybe it should be independent. It's interesting you say that. So, yeah, I haven't sort of formulated my thoughts around that, but you're right. <laughs> You know, we did apply um, for uh, uh, what's called Youth Wellness Hub Ontario. Mm. Um, so we've submitted our application. Um, you know, Vic Fideli was instrumental in sort of supporting us in that. Uh, we received, uh, I think we're up to 23 support letters now uh, from our community. And it's all related to Elmwood. And what that would allow us to do, the budget for that uh, that we submitted is um, 
uh, $647,000, uh, which is five core positions uh, that are very clinical. Uh, it includes a, a portion of a nurse practitioner as well. And that would, that, that would really allow us to open it to the entire community. We're extremely hopeful. There's probably about, I think, there are up to 27 of them in the province, and they're announcing another five. Um, so that would absolutely, which has nothing to do, that comes with funding. And it's year-over-year year funding. It's mm -hmm. not just sort of one year and then you're off. Right. Um, that's year-over-year year funding. Um, you know, they, uh, Youth uh, Wellness Ontario is very supportive of our application as well. Um, you know, there's one in Sudbury that's sort of um, in one room. Um, and so, I mean, when they heard what we're doing at Elmwood, again, with no funding, um, you know, so we're really hopeful around that piece for sure. Uh, so we're supposed to hear about uh, about that this year. Hmm. So if we can move, but you know we're committed to doing. You know we've we're slowly. And I said to my staff, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, just don't op like make sure you do it in stages. So for example, um, you know we have a partnership with uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters. They come in and they they do programming. There was Indigenous painting happening the other night when I was there, and so we're you know we're saying bring. Bring your your people with you, your kids, uh, and so we're going to do it in stages uh, for sure. Uh, the city just announced that um, you know they're going to be holding their summer camps at Elmwood over the summer. Uh, yeah, and we're going to be designated as a an after schools program. So there's three, uh, and they only have two sites now. So Elmwood's going to be the third. What are you doing, retiring? There's uh, no. way too much going on, Giselle. We need you. <laughs> I rescind your retirement. <laughs> well, now you can retire and uh, just do the work for free. Yeah, ah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's right. Oh, and come yeah. go as you please. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But even the hospital, I mean, you know, when we talk about the clinical wing, and I always say it's not adding, you're not necessarily adding more space, uh, more people, I should say. They're just sitting in different seats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you think of the child psychiatrist. Well, instead of reporting to the hospital, he's going to be reporting at Elmwood. Mm -hmm. you know, or to Elmwood. Uh, and then, like I said, there's two bookable spaces where, you know, community counseling center wants to bring an addictions worker in, you know, they can book the space for three days a week. Um, and, but we want to make sure that again, it's, you know, that we, uh, that we ensure that it's sort of seamless. If somebody needs the service, they get it sort of in the moment. So. Well, well let me say this, Giselle, <clears throat> thank you for coming in. Thank you for thank you. your dedication to, uh, to your career, to the people that you serve, uh, to the the team that you work with, I've had like an incredible run uh, hanging out with you guys and doing work with you, and uh, I'm inspired by what you've created with Elmwood. Uh, it's an incredible story about the donation and how that came about. But that's I remember someone a long time ago saying, "You never ask for money; you just connect people with things that they're passionate about," and that's. It was serendipitous, right? It just all sort of came together, right? And I just want to thank you for, first of all, for looking so damn good in a really tough career. You're looking, <laughs> you, you. you look like thank a teenager you. and you shouldn't, you should be weathered. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you look incredible. You've done incredible work and you, you've changed so much in our community here. And I just want to thank you for for everything that you've, you've done in your career. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. If I can, I'd like to just add one thing. Absolutely. Which is um, on May 21st, we're presenting Elmwood to City Council. Um, because right now, the the only thing that is stopping us from moving forward in the clinical wing is we need to renovate the space. Um, so the intention there is, uh, you know, I want to apply for NHFC funding, which you can get 50% up to 2 million, which means that, if we were to say two million, I don't think it would be that much that we would have to raise sort of like a million somewhere. Mm. Um, so anyway, so we're presenting to um, to city council on May twenty first. My intention is to fill up that room. Okay, it's a hundred seats uh, with uh, children, youth, and families, and to just sort of uh, speak to them about. Most of them have come through the space, but really to speak to them about um, you know how it is everyone's responsibility and. You know, city council's uh, social responsibility to 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 make sure that uh, the community is well cared for, and to try to focus them not only on sort of the crisis that's happening now, but 
to please sort of turn their minds to, mm -hmm. um, you know, the younger population and doing some work upstream to prevent that. Well, I, <clears throat> I think it's an important piece in this discussion that we've had is when in the current crisis, uh, I'll say homelessness and, mm -hmm. and, and opioids and things that are happening in our community that's in our face, it's like, how do we solve that? This is how we solve it. Yeah, this is it's, how we start. This for is sure. the upstream part. Yes. This is where it's like, well, it's I don't want to fund a gymnasium. No, this is the upstream part that that starts that whole process. This is where it starts. So I hope they get that message. I'll be there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'd love Cheerion, that. Cheer on, absolutely. I'd love that. Yeah. You need me in a costume, I'll dress in a costume yeah. too. Well, we, <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I love it. <laughs> I'm on it. Okay. Oh my God. If Whatever put, you need. I'm going to put my we staff on that. You uh, should be afraid. I, yeah, you should be afraid. I know your staff. <laughs> I, I just I just want to finish with one part here. Yeah, when sure. We talked briefly about it when we were on the tour. As a journalist, um, <clears throat> uh, most of the stories I ever covered about the CAS weren't good stories. So, uh, the only thing that people heard about were the the um, uh, uh, interventions that were harsh, uh, the, the the things that broke up families. Um, that's their perspective, right? And uh, uh, when I was with the Union of Ontario, Ontario Indians, uh, child and family services was a big issue, and they had to make a, a you know, partitions and services for First Nation communities so that they thought that they were getting better um, child welfare. Mm -hmm. um, hearing what you're doing and how, how you're going about it uh, um, is a complete opposite to all the different CAS coverage I did. And it's really uh, gives me hope that, that oh, there, so there, there's, there's going to be a better way to deal with families that are in crisis. So, thank you so much yeah, for that. Congratulations on your work. Thank you so yeah. much. And thank we you. rescind your retirement. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the air. Oh my God, oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. No, right Giselle, thank you. Thank and you thank so you much. thank you your staff and, and everything you're doing. And you have to, I want to know after you take your mom and dad through. Okay, I will. I promise. Okay, promise? Okay. Promise, promise. I really want to know that <laughs> My story. mom cries at everything, so. Ah, <laughs> she won't disappoint. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, that's the Echo Essentials podcast. I'm Scott Clark. And I'm Dave Dale. Thanks for uh, joining us and uh, listening to the Echo Network.